The ERMAC Center is proud to present the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series. This bi-weekly series hosts six presentations per semester. For the fall 2008 and spring 2009 semesters, the presenters belong to the Faculty of Science and the current Faculty of Applied Science. Today's speaker is Dr. Patricia M. Mooney. Dr. Mooney will present her talk entitled, Materials for New Semiconductor Technologies. Okay, I'm really happy to be able to uh, introduce Pat to you today. Uh, Pat um, came to SFU just about four years ago, and we're almost at the four year anniversary, I guess. Yeah. But before that, she was in, uh, at IBM for about 25 years. That's IBM Research Labs are in New Yorkton Heights, which is close to New York City in New York. And she, uh, she did all of her uh, education out east as well. And uh, I was going to say that uh, while she was at IBM, she worked in problems related to semiconductor uh, def defects in semiconductor films. And she's a very productive scientist. Uh, she's well uh, recognized for her work. Uh, her work at IBM was uh, recognized by two technical achievement awards and several patent awards. She holds uh, 15 patents. Uh, which is not all that common for a physicist. She uh, also um, uh, publishes lots of papers and has been recognized by uh, becoming a fellow of the American Physical Society and uh, the uh, American Association for the Advancement of Science. So since she arrived at SFU, she's been very busy setting up her lab and, uh, and then becoming accustomed to life in Canada. She's now uh, learned to curl, I'm happy to report. <laughs> And, uh, but she's also proven to be a very a great asset to the department. She's a team player and has been very important in the continued uh, evolution of our materials effort in uh, physics, as well as in our graduate program. So we have lots to thank her for. And she's also very involved in outside organizations. Most notably, uh, she works extensively with the American Physical Society. She's been on the executive board, and she's also been on the committee uh, uh, for the status of women in physics. So we're delighted that she made the de decision to leave the West, uh, leave her home in the East Coast and relocate to a foreign country and in order to work, continue her work in semiconductor physics at SFU. And I hope you look forward, as I do, to her presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Barb, for that very nice introduction. Um, in fact, I have had one experience of curling, but I recently watched the pros on TV, and I think to say that I've learned to curl is <laughs> kind of an exaggeration. Anyway, I'd also like to thank uh, Ermax for organizing this seminar series. I wasn't sure what kind of a talk to prepare because I wasn't sure who the audience would be, and um, I, I, I think the instructions said non-technical, which is always very hard to do. So I'm glad to see that there are lots of physicists here because you might stay with me to the end of the talk at least. And I hope the others will, will hang in there for a while too. All right, I'm going to be talking about materials for new semiconductor technologies. Um, I sometimes called a materials physicist, sometimes an applied physicist, and I guess both descriptions are fairly applicable. I'm going to start out with a fairly lengthy introduction about why we care about semiconductors and why we care, um, why the problems we're working on are important. And then I'm going to talk in a kind of an overview way about two of the projects that are going on um, in our lab where students and postdocs have actually made some interesting progress. Now, I think all of you know that semiconductors have lots and lots of applications. In fact, um, we use semiconductors. Here's an example of how we use them with all this wireless and microphones and computers. And we use them in almost every activity that we do today. Um, banking, all kinds of commercial things. Every time I need to order something for my lab, I go on the web. Um, every time I make a plane reservation, um, they're used in medicine, they're used in all kinds of manufacturing applications. Uh, recently, the cost of the electronics package in cars exceeded the value of the steel in cars. Um, they're used in kids' toys. And also, we use them in our research to collect and store 
and analyze data to write papers. So it's hard to imagine what life was like before we had these things. Now, the specific devices that we use, um, the mainstay of computing and memory chips is the field effect transistor. And a lot of my work was related to field effect transistors. In communications, in optical links, we use uh, laser diodes. In cell phones and wireless applications, the key device is the bipolar transistor, which is extremely fast. Um, a recent development is solid state lighting, which is based on the light emitting diode. And it's used in traffic lights, in cars, in display panels. And, and this is an important development, just, just lest you think that transistors are old hat. In fact, this, is, this is development shows what bringing in new materials can do to impact our lives, because it has the potential to save, um, to reduce the worldwide electricity usage by about 10% if all of the lights were to switch over to um, solid state lighting. And this is, in fact, happening right now. All the Christmas lights you buy are nice and cool to the touch. They use almost no power. They last forever. And slowly but surely, this is, this is going to be used um, everywhere. Now, here's some examples. This is the traffic light uh, example. <coughs> this is an example of decorative lighting um, on, on uh, number seven <coughs> World Trade Center. This, this, these are old pictures. Um, this is the NASDAQ sign in Times Square that costs $37 million to build. It's made of 18 million uh, light emitting diodes. And think of the electricity saved by just that one sign. So what are semiconductors? Semiconductors are found in this region of the periodic table. We have the elemental semiconductors that are the group four uh, atoms. And we have compound semiconductors that can include atoms from group three combined with atoms from group five, or perhaps atoms from group six, sorry, group two, combined with atoms from group six. Or we can have a compound semiconductor that consists of two of the group four elements, silicon carbide. And some of our work is on, on that one, which is why I mention it in particular. Now, about 93% of the worldwide semiconductor market is silicon-based. And the other 7% or so are primarily compound semiconductors that, that are used for photonic devices, such as lasers and LEDs. And this part of the market may grow, but silicon continues to dominate um, the economics of, of semiconductors. Now, I, I like to think about the evolution of semiconductors. And it's hard to know where to start, so I always begin with the discovery of the electron, because we can't have electronics without electrons. And that was just a little over 100 years ago. And in the early part of the 20th century, semiconductor properties began to be understood. The crystals were bulk crystals, um, millimeter size initially. And now today's large silicon crystals are, are bulls that are greater than 12 inches in diameter and taller than I am. And for the technology, the, the current manufacturing for silicon technology is on wafers that are slices of these bulls that are 12 inches in diameter. And this whole bull that's larger than I am is one crystal. And I, I find that amazing to think, think that one can have that kind of crystal. Now, the transistor was invented in 1947, about 60 years ago. The first transistors were made of germanium. Shortly after that, the first solar cell. And the first fully transistorized computer, which was made of individual transistors rather than individual vacuum tubes, came along in the early 1950s. And you can see that it had 800 transistors, and it was a fairly large uh, box full of circuitry. The first integrated circuit was invented in 1958, also in germanium. And the first semiconductor laser made of a material called gallium arsenide uh, came in the early 1960s. Memory chips became in, available in the 70s. And the first ones had 1,000 bits. 
The first microprocessor had 2,300 transistors. So we're going from a single transistor to um, 2,300 over the course of not too many years. Now the other very exciting development in the 1970s was um, the development of semiconductor epitaxial growth. And this is a way that, that we start with a, a wafer, which is used as a substrate or a template, and additional layers of semiconductor are, are added on top of that wafer. And what's exciting about semi, semiconductor epitaxy is it enabled us to mix different kinds of semiconductors in layers on top of the substrate. And these are called heterostructures. And these were exciting because it, it provided a material in which to demonstrate very, very basic quantum physics effects. And also then to use those, those quantum effects in improving uh, today's devices. So late 70s, early 80s, we have the PC. The Apple IIc was the first computer you could buy as a standalone thing on your desk. It came with, in a big box with a screen and a keyboard. Up until that time, the personal computer was a kit that you bought and wired together. And students had a lot of fun with this, but other people didn't really um, have access to computers prior to this time. We have the Cray 2 supercomputer in 1985. And here we've gone from 10 to the 6 logic operations per second to 10 to the 9. So the speed has increased by three orders of magnitude. 1990, we have the World Wide Web. Um, this was a proposal for standard computer addresses that enables every computer in the world to talk to any other computer in the world. And it's enabled all kinds of web-based applications that no organization can survive without. Um, some of us know that fondly of Sims. Um, we get other things that are more fun as well. Uh, global positioning system was another kind of, kind of uh, major event um, that combines satellites and atomic clocks and little devices that are this big that tell me that, that I'm standing within a meter of some set of coordinates on the Earth's surface. And again, it has all kinds of uses um, from entertainment and fun and hiking to um, keeping track of, of um, all kinds of military things. Now, 50 years after the first transistor, we had integrated circuits with 10 million transistors. The most recent chip from um, Intel, which is used for their, for, for their um, servers, has over 2 billion transistors. So you can see that over the course of 50 years, we've made enormous progress. And this progress is summarized in uh, what's known as Moore's Law. Now, Gordon Moore, back in 1964, predicted that over 10 years, the rate of increase of the number of devices uh, on a transistor chip, on an integrated circuit chip, would increase um, at the rate of about 24 months, uh, doubling every 24 months. And this, this progress has essentially continued, the, the slope is more like, like, well, initially it was 18 months, the slope is more now about doubling every 24 months. But you can see this, these are memory chips up here with um, two and four billion transistors. And the, the microprocessor, the newest microprocessor would be essentially on that same point. So the, the number of transistors per chip has increased by nine order orders of magnitude in 50 years, which I find pretty mind-boggling. Now, how has this been accomplished? It's been accomplished through, primarily through miniaturization. It's been accomplished um, to some extent by using larger and larger chip sizes. And it's also been accomplished by innovations in both fabrication methods and in the materials that we use to fabricate these chips. So this miniaturization is known as scaling, which simply means shrinking all of the device dimensions in a, in a particular way. And just looking at some simple physics, we know that the electron velocity uh, for a particular electric field is proportional to the mobility of the material. And therefore, the time it takes for a given material 
to go from the source, for an electron to move from the source to the drain, simply depends on the distance it has to go. And so the shorter that distance is, the faster response the device will have. Now we can also increase speed by increasing this, this number, uh, electron mobility. And we can do that by changing the material, getting rid of silicon using something like gallium arsenide, where, which has a much higher electron mobility, or we can do this by modifying the material in certain ways. And, and in the case of silicon, the way that, it's, that, that the, today's devices have been speeded up is by, use, by using strained silicon instead of just standard silicon. Okay, this is what the first uh, integrated circuit looked like. There's one transistor, a capacitor, and the, the germanium chip is divided into three regions with three devices. What I want to show you here is that the size of the devices is actually very small, but making electrical contact to those devices takes up a big amount of the space on this picture. And this holds true for integrated circuits, of course. This is a chip that was fabricated at IBM. It's a microprocessor chip. Um, it was used in Apple computers for a while. It is, was used in video games, where you want the, the fastest circuitry you can get to handle the vid video images. This is what the package looks like. And this chip has uh, 276 million transistors in it. And what we're looking at is a top-down view of the chip, and what we're seeing, the colors come from the different metal patterns from the interconnections on the chip. Now, if you look at, at a cross-section of a chip, what you see is there are, there are here, this one has six levels of copper metal wires connecting all the devices. These are separated by an insulating material or a dielectric material. At the bottom, we have tungsten, and then right here underneath the tungsten, in a tiny layer on the top of the silicon, is where all the transistors are. And so once again, you see the transistors themselves are incredibly tiny, but these metal interconnections take up a huge amount of space. And the package then has to bring all these connections to the outside world, as well as to remove heat that's generated when the transistors turn on. This is a 3D image showing what this metal wiring <laughs> Uh, might look like, or actually looks like. Now, looking at the transistor itself, we see that this is a nanoscale device. There's, the, the, the distance under the gate here is 70 nanometers. In the dimension going into the board, the device might be several microns. But the actual transistor, the actual current is flowing in a layer that's about five nanometers deep underneath this gate. And what you don't see on the picture is the gate dielectric material, which is about two nanometers thick in today's devices. So we have, we have, we have nanoscale at least in two of the three dimensions of our transistors. And what's very important, since the current is flowing along this interface between the gate dielectric and the semiconductor, the quality of this interface is extremely important. And one of the reasons that silicon has been the dominant um, semiconductor material is because the, the gate dielectric is silicon dioxide, which is very well um, stable oxide that's easy to make, and the quality of this interface is extremely good. And so that's, that's a main reason for, for the success of silicon. Now, if you, if you see what I've written here, we have lots of opportunities to include materials in, in making this thing. We have the packaging materials, we have all the interconnection materials, and we have all of the materials that, that go into forming the contacts to the transistor, um, as well as, as the, the fundamental silicon semiconductor itself. And so in order to accomplish uh, everything that we've accomplished, a huge amount of research has been done, a huge amount of materials science has been done, and without which we would not have um, the technology that we have today. So semiconductors, the ones that I'm interested in and the ones that are used for the, for the highest performance devices are crystalline. And what that means is that there's a regular array of atoms in the crystal, and we describe this array of atoms in terms of a unit cell, and I'm showing you here the unit cell for silicon. 
you can see that each silicon atom is bonded to four neighboring silicon atoms. And this is a cubic structure, and the, the lattice constant of the unit cell is this dimension A. Now, diamond, silicon, and germanium all have this crystal structure. But the difference between them is that the size of the unit cell, or the dimension A, is different in the different materials. Now, compound semiconductors have a similar unit cell, except that in the case of gallium arsenide, for example, a gallium atom will be bonded to four arsenic atoms. And it's, it's, um, but but the, the, the placement of the atoms is very similar. But again, the size of the unit cell is going to vary uh, from material to material. Now, I think I went the wrong way. OK, what is a defect in a semiconductor? Well, a defect is basically anything that disrupts this perfect crystalline lattice. And we can have point defects, which only really involve one lattice site and maybe the immediate atoms close to that lattice site. We could have a missing atom, which is called a vacancy. We can have an extra atom that's just stuck in there between the regular lattice sites. So it would be an interstitial. And that could be an impurity interstitial, or it could be just an extra silicon atom in the case of silicon. Or we can have a substitutional impurity where one of the lattice atoms is replaced by an impurity. And, and there are many impurities that, that can, can do this. But we also can have extended defects in, in a semiconductor. And an extended defect involves many, many lattice sites. Um, this is an example of a dislocation where all of a sudden we have, we have a plane of atoms that just stops. And so in this part of the crystal, we have perfect lattice. In this part of the crystal, we have a perfect lattice. But there's an extra plane of atoms stuck here. And right around the edge of this plane, the atoms are out of position. And there's a very large strain field. And so this extends into the board here, into the screen, um, for however long. And, and that's why it's called a line defect, because the disruption of the lattice is a long line that goes through the crystal. And there's a high local strain associated uh, with that. Now, electrically, what happens when, when we have defects is that the electronic structure of the material is changed. Now, what I'm showing on the left is a typical um, diagram that shows the the, the, the vertical scale is increasing energy. And what we find from quantum mechanics is that when atoms are, uh, come together to form a crystal, there are bands of energy values that are allowed that, that, where, that, that the electrons can have. And there are other bands, regions of energy that are not allowed. And in particular, the lowest occupied energy states form the uh, valence band. The lowest unoccupied energy states form the conduction band. And there's a, a range of forbidden energies known as the band gap where, where that electrons cannot have. Now, when we form a semiconductor and it's not perfect, when we have defects or disruptions of the perfect lattice, the result of that is that we introduce electronic states in this forbidden gap. And some of these are called shallow levels because they lie very close in energy, either to the conduction band states or the valence band states. And some of them are called deep levels because they're pretty far away from, from, the, other, from the states in the conduction band or the valence band. In general, the, shallow, the, the impurities that give us shallow levels are desired because they enable us to change the conductivity of the material from something that's an insulator to something that may be as conducting as a metal. And this is done by, by intentionally introducing certain impurities in well-controlled concentrations. Now, the deep levels are usually not wanted in a crystal. They may de degrade the properties. And so what we want to know when we, when we study a dislocation is we want to know where its energy level is, and we want to know what, what atoms it is, if it's an impurity, for example. And, and one example of an atom that we do not want in a semiconductor is copper. And you'll remember I showed you a few slides back that all those interconnections are made of copper, but the bottom row of metal connections was tungsten. And that's because 
if any copper ever gets in silicon, the, the properties will be changed and the devices will not work. And so a huge technological part of introducing copper for those interconnections, previously they had been aluminum or aluminum copper alloys, was to find a way to make sure that the copper does not get into the semiconductor. Okay, what are we doing at SFU? Well, um, I've established, as Barb said, the Semiconductor Defect Spectroscopy Laboratory. It's on the Burnaby campus. Uh, these are people in my group. Um, we have three graduate students here and a, a former postdoc, Eric Chen. And the two projects that I'm going to be talking about are, are one that Eric worked on and then the second one is one that Dave Owen was the primary person but also uh, Dave Lackner contributed to this project. So um, what do we do? Well, we focus on semiconductor <coughs> defects. We, they're interesting. Um, my friends at IBM kind of didn't like it when I got interested in something because it usually meant they were having some kind of bad news. Um, they preferred to ignore defects, but every once in a while they couldn't and I would get involved and we might learn something. Um, we're interested in new semiconductor materials. Um, that we, materials that might have new properties, such as one example, we don't work on them in my lab, but the new materials that led rise to solid state lighting would be something new that came along about 15 years ago. So um, we collaborate with experts that are doing epitaxial crystal growth to try to understand defect issues related to the materials that they're growing. Um, probably because of my uh, long stay at IBM, I, I like defects that, that are causing a problem for somebody. Um, in other words, that are slowing down being able to implement a new technology. Um, and I also have some projects that are based on the whole notion that we want to avoid introducing defects into materials. We want to do things without introducing defects. Now, we do electrical measurements to look at the electronic states in the, in the gap. And the technique we use is called deep level transient spectroscopy, was invented in the 1970s at Bell Labs and I was in the right place at the right time to be one of the first people outside of Bell Labs to, to use this method. And this is, this is a, a picture of some of the electronics that that's make up that spectroscopy. It's, the electronics are actually fairly simple but what, what makes it more complex is the brain that you need to, to understand what you're looking at. So it's never become a push button technique where you put the sample down and the computer tells you the answer. Um, as far as I know, I'm the only one using this technique in Canada. So um, that's, that's what Canada gained when I, when I moved. Um, we also do structural measurements. We use high resolution X-ray diffraction to measure the size of the unit cell in the layers that we grow. I've told you that different materials have different sizes of unit cells and one of the things we want to do sometimes is to change the unit cell size and we use X-ray diffraction methods to measure that. And we also use scanning probe measurements and um, mostly we use that to look at the quality of the surface of, of the materials. Now I'm also using the 4D Labs clean room for fabrication. We're very excited that that's coming online and has been available for the last uh, little while. Nano imaging facility is another SFU facility that's very important for our work. And historically, I've done some X-ray measurements at synchrotron facilities, and more of that is planned for the near future. Oops. Okay, um, why is silicon carbide interesting? I've told you that we're, we're interested in silicon carbide and the answer is that there are a few things that silicon cannot do. They cannot do at all. Um, let's look at the materials, the difference. What you see is that the silicon band cap is about one electron volt. The silicon carbide band gap is about three times larger. The critical electric field is significantly larger for, for silicon carbide than for silicon. Um, other properties are quite similar. The, there's a little bit of difference in electron mobility and saturation velocity. The thermal conductivity of silicon carbide is higher, which is important for removing heat um, from circuits. 
But the, the key feature that makes silicon carbide interesting for MOSFET applications is that both of them have this stable oxide SiO2, which is not true of the compa other compound semiconductor uh, Y band gap materials. So silicon carbide can be used for technologies where we want to operate the devices at high temperatures because the, the, the larger band gap helps with that and at high power because the larger breakdown voltage helps for that as well. Um, and because it's not in some ways so different from silicon, wafers are available, it's easy to dope, people have learned how to make contacts, and we have this high quality gate oxide. Now this is a silicon power MOSFET, and the problem we're interested in is the problem of channel mobility. Now the effective mobility measured in devices is about 10 centimeters squared per volt second compared to 850 in a bulk crystal. So something's happening. Here, here we have our gate, our SiO2 oxide. The electron current is going from the source, which forms a ring around this. It's traveling under the gate and then it's traveling down through the bulk of the silicon carbide. So we have the channel, which is the, the current flow under the gate, and that's where the mobility is extremely low. And in our device, the total on resistance of the device is primarily the sum of the drift region uh, resistance and the channel resistance. And for, for devices that have a, a very small drift region, the channel mobility dominates the own resistance of the device, and, and that limits the effectiveness of these devices. So what's going on? Why, why is the mobility so degraded um, at that, when, when we have current flow at that interface? And one difference, when, we, when, when silicon dioxide is formed by reacting silicon and oxygen, the, 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 the reactants, silicon and oxygen, are the only thing that is around when the oxide is formed. In the case of silicon carbide, we have carbon. And when, we ha when, the, when the chemical reaction occurs, carbon and oxygen are, are there's excess carbon that's released. It, it forms um, carbon monoxide. And the carbon monoxide gas diffuses out away from the interface. Um, out into the outside world. But sometimes all of the carbon is not removed. And so the speculation has been for a long time that the reason that there's a high density of, of defects at this interface compared to the low density of defects at silicon is because of excess carbon. Now in the case of silicon, the interface is not perfect, but when when the sample is exposed to hydrogen, hydrogen dif can diffuse in, and hydrogen interacts with whatever defects are at the surface and passivates them. In other words, it saturates any dangling bonds of silicon and renders those defects electrically inactive. And so one of the... Um, interesting, well, let me just say, what, what might these defects be at the interface? The red line here interface, it, it represents the surface of the silicon carbide. Here in 3D, we have silicon atoms on the surface that are bonded to three carbon atoms just below the surface. And this silicon is going to bond with oxygen and f start to form the oxide layer on top. So here we have oxygen bonded to silicon, and this is what the perfect interface might look, at, look like. But here we have what might be a defect, and this is called the carbon interstitial, where there's an extra carbon here. Here's another defect where there's a missing oxygen in, in the, the next layer up of, of atoms. This is highly schematic, but I think it makes the point. And another possibility is that we have excess carbon in the top layers of the silicon carbide itself. In addition, we can have other defects going on up here in the oxide layer. And so these are the physical defects that, that uh, might give rise to problems uh, with the device. 
Now, when we do electrical measurements, what we find is that there's a very high density of interface states. And we're looking for interface states that are close to the conduction band that degrade the, uh, reduce the mobility of electrons in the, in the, at that, in the conduction band at that interface. And what we, f what we see here is that this is a, a, a log scale here, so, so we have an exponentially decreasing interface state density as the energy goes from zero would be the energy of the con conduction band and as we go deeper into the gap. And so it's this very high density of interface states that we want to understand and we would like to try to um, get rid of or at least get rid of their effects. Now, a few years ago, the group, uh, there's been a longstanding collaboration with two groups at one at Auburn University, Professor John Williams, one at Vanderbilt University, Professor Len Feldman, and they discovered a few years ago that if they exposed these samples to um, NO at high temperature, then, and, and here this, this shows data for high temperature uh, annealing for two hours, the defect's density was reduced by an order of magnitude. And again, we still see this exponential decay, but everywhere along it's reduced. And this was actually a breakthrough, the fact that nitrogen could passivate 90% of these defects made it possible for Cree to introduce the first silicon uh, MOSFETs, silicon carbide MOSFETs this year. But we don't understand this process. We still don't really know what the defects are. We still don't really know what's going on at this interface. So our group got involved in this project, and the idea was to use the deep level transient spectroscopy to try to see if we could learn something, get additional information about these defects. So the samples we're looking at consists of uh, um, an epitaxial, very high quality epitaxial silicon carbide layer, a thin oxide layer, and some metal contacts. And we looked at samples after oxidation, and then some were further exposed to um, NO at high temperature. And what the Vandal group built, built group find is that after the nitrogen exposure, there's a very, very thin um, well, there, there's a measurable, detectable amount of nitrogen at this interface, and it's within a couple of nanometers of the interface. And they don't detect nitrogen in the oxide, they don't detect it in the silicon carbide, only at the interface. And this seems to be proof that um, nitrogen is chemically reacting with something at the interface and, and changing um, the electronic properties. Okay, so we use capacitance measurements, capacitance spectroscopy. Um, just remi remind you that a capacitor, this is a simple parallel plate capacitor, and capacitance is a measure of the change in charge when we change the voltage. It's also a geometric um, property, and for a simple parallel, parallel plate capacitor, it depends on the property of the material between the plates, which might be a vacuum, or it might be a, um, a semiconductor, or it might be an oxide layer, and, and then the thickness of that layer or the spacing of the plates and their area. So our MOS capacitor is a combination of the, the oxide capacitance and the capacitance at the, the interface related to the semiconductor, and the standard capacitance measurements are how we determine the energy distribution of the defects that I showed you before. But what we do in our lab that, in addition to that, is we can measure the, the rate at which charge is trapped in those energy states and the rate at which it's emitted. And this enables us to distinguish different trap species. So here I'm showing you a little data. Um, this is CV measurements, standard CV measurements taken at room temperature and low temperature. And right away you see that the, this, there's this huge shift that's much reduced in the nitrided samples. And this is just a, a raw data, a, a saturated D, C, constant capacitance DLTS spectrum for the oxidized sample and then for samples that have been nitrided. And we see that, yes, our technique also detects the fact that there are fewer traps or defects at that interface.
And our results in the as oxidized samples were similar to what some other people in, in Europe had done. Um, and we were the first ones to look at nitrided samples and be able to compare them and see the difference. So summarizing a significant amount of hard work on the part of Eric Chen, what I'm plotting here is the energy position of the, the, the defect where zero represents the energy of the conduction band, and here's moving down into the forbidden gap. And here I'm plotting the capture cross-section. And this is a measure of how quickly charges are emitted from those traps, and this is a measure of how, how quickly charges are trapped. And what we see right away is that we have a continuous, more or less continuous energy uh, energy level in the gap, but what, what the, the capture rates form three groups. And this is a big clue that we're dealing with three different trap species. Now further what we find, the blue points represent the, the measurements in the nitrided sample, and what we find is that all of the traps in the nitrided sample have very small values of this capture cross-section, and that's telling us that these group one and group two traps have been changed by the nitridation process. In other words, those energy states are no longer there. They're somewhere else. And, but, but we don't detect them um, anymore. The other key thing here is that the remaining traps have very small capture cross-sections. The traps that are left at the silicon interface have capture cross-sections that would be up here on this plot. So that's that the, 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 the actual interface defects that are left in silicon carbide are quite different from what would be seen in SiO2 on silicon. Okay, this is, what we did was calculate then the interface state density from our DLTS data, and what we find for the oxidized sample, we get this curve, and here I'm comparing it to the standard curve that I showed you before. This is a linear plot now. And what we find is we get very good agreement for energies greater than 0.2 electron volts, but for some reason, we're not detecting the large number of traps at lower energies. So that's telling us that, that those traps are some different species still from the ones that we detect because we don't see them. And so not only are two of the trap species that we see changed by nitrogen, but also the ones we don't see are changed as well. And then what we find is that we get very good agreement between the standard method and, and our method of calculating this for the nitrided samples. And there's basically the dominant trap in, in these is one species that is also present here that's not affected by the nitrogen annealing. Okay. Um, we're continuing. This is an ongoing project. We're continuing to work on this to understand what the effects of nitridation are and trying to come up with experiments by comparing different um, types of silicon carbide to try to understand more about what these defects might be and how to further reduce um, their concentrations. Okay, I'd like to switch gears now and very quickly tell you about another pro group of projects or projects that we've started um, pretty recently. This is a, a plot showing the two very important parameters of semiconductors. The lattice constant is plotted on the horizontal. The band gap energy is plotted on the vertical. And the three materials that are circled are materials that are available as bulk crystals to be used as substrates for epitaxial growth. Now, we do band gap engineering by mixing these materials. For example, if we mix gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide, there's a very small change in lattice constant, <coughs> but a very, very large change in band gap depending on how, what the, the, the fraction of um, aluminum arsenide in the crystal. On the other hand, we can, we can reduce the band gap by mixing gallium arsenide and indium arsenide, but when we do that, we also find that the lattice constant of the crystal changes as well. And this causes problems. And you can see an example of the kind of problems it causes here, where I'm showing a 25% mixture of silicon and germanium grown on top of silicon. 
If the lattice mismatch between the two materials, between the lattice constant of the two materials is very small, what happens when you do the epitaxy is that the crystal, the epitaxial layer adjusts itself so that the, the lattice constant in the plane matches the one of the substrate. And it adjusts itself by either expanding in the vertical direction, i.e. it's compressed, or expanding horizontally, in which case it's under tension. And these strain layers are good for, for many applications because strain modifies some of their properties in a desired way. But if the mismatch is too large, in this case the, the difference in the unit cell size between 25% alloy of silicon germanium and silicon is only 1%, but this is too large to grow a good quality epitaxial layer. So people all over the world working on lattice mismatch semiconductors have tried to come up with ways to avoid these defects. And one way is by grading the alloy composition so that we get a pretty good quality alloy layer on top of a substrate. But the question we ask ourselves, this still has some dislocations running up to the surface. And the questions, yeah, each of these dark lines, by the way, are dislocations. We're seeing that high strain field of the dislocation in the image. Um, anyway, the question is that are these good enough for the various applications? Uh, the same scheme is used in gallium arsenide. Again, defect densities are about 10 to the 7 compared to substrate densities in the 3 fives of a, of a few thousand or even lower in silicon. So we came up with some ideas about how to change the lattice constant of the layer without introducing defects. And the first experiment we did, this was done while I was still at IBM, was we fabricated silicon membranes. This is a 30 nanometer membrane. It's attached to the silicon substrate by a, a pedestal that's made of uh, silicon dioxide. And these are fabricated by standard semiconductor fabrication methods. And we then grew our silicon germanium layer on this membrane. Now it grows also on the wafer here, and it's very bad quality. But what we found here is that the membrane just expands. So here the difference in lattice constant is, is accommodated elastically. And you can think of a slinky. You expand it, it <coughs> comes back. If you hold it, it comes back. Or you compress it. And so based on this kind of thing, this, is, this shows that structure that, that, that I just showed you. This is what, what it looks like. We made arrays of them so that we could measure them. And this ultimately led us to be able to, well, let me not go quite so fast. Here, here we made similar structures starting from epitaxial films and etching them. And as the film was freed from the substrate, it would accommodate itself to the strain. So here at SFU, we've tried to implement this same idea in using the compound semiconductors. And the fabrication process is that we start with, with epitaxial layers that are grown in Simon Watkins' lab. We form our slab. We undercut our slab to make it freestanding. And if we completely remove this, this um, in this case it's an aluminum arsenide layer, we find that the relaxed structure is attached to the, silica, to the gallium arsenide substrate. And this is an example of these <coughs> bonded structures. This is x-ray data showing that the lattice constant, we're measuring the lattice constant in the vertical direction, showing that some of the strain has been relieved because the lattice constant has changed. What we find is that if we heat this material after fabrication, we form a strong bond. Here when the wafers cleaved, the bonded features also cleave. If we don't anneal the wafer, they don't. So this is a step is required to make a strong bond. And what we found here is that um, these structures behave according to a very simple model where the strain, the final strain in this green layer is going to depend simply on the thickness of the green layer relative to the thickness of the two blue layers. Now the reason we've made two blue layers here is that we don't want the, the structure to bend. 
And by dividing the blue material in two, putting it on top of the bottom, we get only expansion and contraction in the plane of the wafer. And we find that the 3-5 the structures fit on the same calculated curve as do some of the earlier silicon germanium structures, so that this process, we've, we've developed a process that works. The physics seems to be the same in both materials. So to summarize, um, new materials are absolutely crucial for continuing development of semiconductor technologies that play a major role in everything we do. Um, it's important to understand defects and it's important to reduce their concentrations or to avoid them in order for new materials to be useful for new applications. Um, in our lab, we focus on projects that are related to this, and I've just told you about two ongoing projects that we have some interesting good results in. So thank you very much for your attention. The focus of the SFU Canada Research Chairs Seminar Series is to provide an opportunity to the wider SFU community to learn more about the current research interests of the SFU Canada Research Chair holders. Our next presentation will be on February 12, 2009. Dr. Derek Bingham will present his talk entitled Efficient Emulators of Computer Simulators of Photometric Redshifts Using Compactly Supported Correlation Functions.